the network for the AV industry. What are you listening to? This. This is AV. This. This. This is AV Nation. Nation. This is AV Nation. Ready. AV. AV Week. Performing. Scan. Week. Online. This is AV Week. This is AV Week, your weekly wrap-up of audiovisual news and information. My name is Tim Albright. I am your host with us this week from Commercial Integrator Magazine. His name is Craig McCormick. How are you? How are you, sir? I'm doing well. How about yourself? Okay. Also with us is Mr. Justin Kennington. Justin is, wow, the real Tim Albright is <laughs> Twitter handle. <laughs> Justin gotcha. Is somebody smarter. Than How are you, sir? Wonderful, thank you. Ready to party. Yeah, I can see that. Also with us, uh, this is the first time we've had somebody on from, from Africa, Boaz uh, Shani. Uh, we, met, we met Boaz at um, ISE last year. Uh, he's an he's a integrator in Uganda. So how are you, sir? Very okay. Thank you, thank you very much for staying up late and, and, uh, and joining us. We're, we're recording this at 2 p.m. Eastern time, which is roughly 10 or 11 p.m. Uh, the time, so thank you, sir. Yeah, 9, 9 p.m. here. Yeah. 9 p.m. <coughs> okay, so not yeah, it's not fine. Uh, yeah, we're okay. At least, uh, the, the head up of, um, head of, uh, well, Red Band and everything else. Cool, so. um, Apart from being cool, man. You good? Mr. Netta? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes he's, he's fine, Tim. Here. Thank you for asking. <laughs> thank you for asking. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you what, this day has been an yeah, interesting. Still musical. Yeah. All right. Uh, first off, I want to say a couple things. Bo has real quickly because I, I want to start this off and, and say, uh, just kind of give us a sense um, of maybe some differences or some similarities uh, of of in all seriousness what it's like to do AV, you know, in. in I'm going to say another country because you're in your own country. But what's it like to do AV in, in Uganda? Sorry, my internet went off the moment we went live, so if That's you can repeat. Right. Yeah, what's it like? That's to a reasonable do answer. <laughs> what's it like to do an AV <laughs> in Uganda? Uh, it's, it's, it's challenging. People don't understand anything much here. So it's, it's a very big challenge, but um, very interesting. All right, let's get going. Uh, first up, we've got uh, the first story, actually. This is a real quick, there's no commentary here, uh, unless you saw these guys, in which case, sure, comment. Uh, but the very first uh, Infocom Innovation Showcase Contest winner, and the winner is Collaboration Squared. Uh, Collaboration Squared has a new uh, software-based ETC, and if you're not familiar with what this contest was or how it worked, uh, somewhere in Hall D, actually right behind our booth, uh, in, in, we were six, 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 seven. Um, they, uh, they had this nice little area and you could go around. It was, it was first time, uh, presenters, people had never presented it at Infocom before. No one, you had not, never, uh, exhibited before. Uh, so Justin, you guys were out. Um, but, uh, it, it was kind of neat, right? You go through there, they had a 10 by 10 booth, uh, had a couple buddies that from, from different companies that, that were there. And, and afterwards people who attended Infocom. Uh, got to vote on on who they thought the the, the most uh, innovative uh, product was, or or you know the most creative. And so these guys won. So they won um, a, a ten by ten booth, a, a ten by ten booth for next year. Uh, they got to be a part of, of some other really cool things with them. So congratulations to uh, Collaboration Squared, uh, Mr. Tucker, uh, our, our very own Mr. George Tucker, uh, interviewed them and did a neat little uh, video presentation or video recording of their booth. Uh, so you can check that out on our site. So. Don't forget the the ten thousand dollars. Yes, the ten thousand dollars. That's not a bad deal either. So, we're gonna put the ten thousand dollars actually. But. All right, uh, we're gonna pick on Craig for a second just because. You know, oh boy. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, and then we're gonna pick on Justin because he has something to do with life and something to do with this. Huh. But, um, 
for those of you watching on YouTube and the live stream, Microsoft delays Surface Hub. Bum, bum, bum. Cites manufacturing issues. Immediately, I thought Justin did something in Crestron's factory, but no, alas, it was not his fault. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Craig, the re reason I'm going to pick on you is um, you and I talked uh, extensively last year in Invocom 2014 mm -hmm. about their lovely booth and the, and the very comfortable couches they had, and, and lots of was written and lots was said, giving Microsoft a hard time. So at ISE this year and Infocom in 2015, they had stuff at the booth, right? They had this wonderful uh, Microsoft hub. Started taking orders July 1 with a bunch of integrators. You guys had a great story about that. Uh, then about two or three days ago, this came down the pipeline. And, and you even said, I think you, your, your headline for your piece in, in CI was, Microsoft got it right. Right. Um, I don't think you were wrong, by the way. I, I don't think you were, you were incorrect. I think that that you got it. You got it right. I'm <clears throat> saying they got it right, which sounds a little weird. Um, but you know, you didn't know that they were going to have these production issues. But coming to the show, showing what they did, and showing it in the way they did, I think you you were correct in saying they got it right. Um, but what does this do? I mean, what does this do to the uh, faith that we have? Uh, what does it do uh, to the faith that integrators have uh, in in Microsoft at this point? Well, I, I, I think you probably won't be surprised to learn that I've taken a fair bit of ribbing in the last couple of days for, for writing writing what I wrote uh, about you know Microsoft getting it right. Um, it, I, I did find it kind of amusing. Uh, one of the reports said that uh, part of the reason for the delay was that there was too much demand for the Surface Hub and they couldn't keep up with that, which uh, that, that just a big problem to have. Yes, strikes me as maybe not entirely uh, genuine, but. Um, I, I think what happened with with Microsoft at, at Infocom is they heard from a lot of people. They probably you know heard questions they weren't expecting to hear, heard things that maybe they weren't ready for, and you know ha had to kind of answer, you know, co go back and kind of answer those questions. I mean, certainly their their Surface hubs had 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 some bugs, but so did a lot of technology in a lot of the booths I, I went to. So. Um, Obviously, they're a bigger company and certainly a bigger target for a lot of people. Um, it certainly does, doesn't help help their their reputation among in, integrators and and in in the community that that they ha have this delay. But I, as I had uh, I said in a conversation on Twitter today with with somebody else, I I do think they learn quite a bit and they'll they'll use that information that they learned and and make the product better when when it is you know finally ready for uh, for mass release. All right, Chris for, uh, or for Justin, we're going to pick on you because Preston has a partnership with with Microsoft. And say what you can say, and, and you know we'll we'll redact this. Absolutely, we'll we'll cut it out if you. you know, uh, no, we're we're saving the slide. Uh, I believe seriously. You. Say what you can say, and, and and tell me to go jump off a cliff. But what does this do for you guys? I mean, it, it does it put you guys behind the eight ball too. I don't think so. Um, our, our partnership related to Surface Hub was about uh, bringing some of the parts and pieces uh, that you might want to extend and expand a, a Surface Hub system. Uh, so that means parts and pieces of digital media. Um, was Surface Hub going to drive some more demand for digital media? Yes. Do we still sell plenty of digital media to plug into Samsung TVs and LG TVs and Panasonic TVs? Yes. Um, so this is an exciting product, uh, and I think it's going to be very cool to see it in the world. I think there will be some digital media systems and Crestron control systems wrapped around it. Uh, but as far as any major impact to our business, I, I don't think this slip is going to mean much. I don't think it would. Uh, I don't think it would. Um, I think all we're seeing here is is the very simple fact that manufacturing real complex products is hard. Uh, you know, we've been doing it for 40-something years and, and are practiced at it, and, and we still have trouble sometimes, and it's hard to meet schedules and deliver things. Microsoft isn't in this business. Uh, they want to be, and they've, and they've got a, a cool machine here uh, to do it, but it's not, it's not a shock that it didn't go smoothly. You know, we'll see, we'll see ideally they're delaying it because they want to get it right, uh, like Craig was just mentioning. So hopefully, you know, a couple of months later it will come out. Uh, and be a, the solid product uh, that everybody's hoping for. 
All right. Mr. Uh, Mr. Neto, from your standpoint, you saw this first at ISC and then again at, at Infocom this year. Uh, as someone who you were kind of excited about it uh, at, at one point because you live in the corporate world, what does this do for you and, and for your design, uh, not design future, but, but putting this in, uh, in, in future projects? If they're going to delay a product that's coming out, um, I, I have no problems with it. If you need to bake it a little bit more, I think it may be related also, not to just the feedback that, re that they received at both ISC and Infocom um, 2015. <coughs> I think that, you know, this also goes back to Windows 10. If that is part of their uh, operation system that they plan on putting in there, it's probably still getting baked up because that's not even out yet. The, the, the real final version's not ready yet to go out, so that may be part of the of the issue as well. As far as the touch screen technology, they've been doing this uh, when it was Perceptive Pixel, so I don't think it's a hardware manufacturing issue from a, you know, the touch screen working or not working, so I don't think we have to worry about that. I think it has a lot more to do with the Windows 10 system. Uh, from a corporate perspective, um, yeah, the, 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 the attendance of the people that were down at Infocom uh, that were there from corporations that were looking at an out-of-the-box type solution that they could take, put on the wall, one, two, three, you know, get a link system, a couple cameras. Yeah, they may be a little bit impatient waiting for it from the AV integration side. I'd rather this thing bake out a little bit better uh, from Microsoft's end. I know Crestron's waiting for it. Uh, I know that the integrators that have promised to be the sole uh, in, not integrators to it, but uh, distributors of it are waiting for it. It all sounds good, but, but it's technology, like, like Justin said, you know, this stuff's not easy. It's not uh, something that happens overnight, and I'd rather see this thing out through anyway. Uh, I'm not an early adopter of anything. I'd rather wait Gen, Gen 2 before, you know, ad adopting it, to, to say. So, I, I think... I think if Surface Hub had been released last year and Microsoft hadn't had the empty booth that they had last year, I don't think this would be as big of a deal. I don't think people would be making as big of a deal about it. I think the fact that they had the empty booth last year with the, the couches and the, the soccer and all that stuff and the charging stations, I think they just kind of got off to a bad start in this industry in, in a lot of people's eyes, and, and I think that kind of made the, the target on them a little bit bigger. I, I know I sound like I work for Microsoft and I'm defending them, you know, up and down and all that stuff, but, I, I mean, I, I, I see a lot of potential in, in this. Um, I, I think it's it's going to turn out to be a good product and, and one that the people will, or companies will, will definitely implement at some point, but I, I think... You know, you never get a second chance to make a first impression, and, and certainly they, they started off on the wrong foot, and, and, and I think that probably made it worse. You know, it products get delayed all the time. You know, it, you guys all know that. Um, the, the fact that it happened with the basically the first big product that they're trying to move into this market, I, I think, kind of makes it seem like a bigger deal than it probably is. I, I, I think, think we so. need to I give uh, Microsoft uh, some credit for coming into the table of the AV. We've seen them also in ISC trying to come in with Skype and all sorts of things. So it's credit for them, and we need other companies, and they will only help the AV to be more recognized in the world. In the end, this part is is going to be forgotten. Right now, we don't have a product, so we've got you know release dates and, and empty booths to talk about. Five years from now, we're going to look back, and either this product is great, and we're going to say, oh, look at this, Microsoft Surface Hub Generation 4, what a wonderful product. Or we're going to look back and say, wow, what a piece of crap that was. <laughs> uh, but we're not going to look back and say, oh, remember when they delayed by three months? This is you know this is what we have to talk about now. But in the end, you the product is going to speak for itself. Off. Justin, people remember. I, that's the thing, and and, and I, I, I I want to take a little bit of issue with with um, uh, with what Craig said. It, Craig, do you really? I I don't think that yes, there there's that first impression, but over the last four or five years, the the industry in general has I think lost patience with things not shipping. Right? Uh, I think that regardless if this was Crestron or if it was Extron or AMX or Aurora or one of the booths in the back. 40, there, there, are, there have, there's this contingency that if you're not shipping when you say you're shipping, then there's something wrong, right? Uh, you know, Justin probably feels that more than anybody on this call. I, uh, you know, 
Craig, do you think that that even if you know if this was somebody else, right? Let, let's let's say Crestron. Let's say Crestron, you know, it, it devised I don't know, 16K over wireless, and they said it was gonna it was gonna ship in in September, and they said, oh wait, by the way, it, it's not gonna ship in September now. It's gonna ship in in December because we had a problem with this widget. Yeah, I, you think I think they've them the past. I do. I think Crestron would get the benefit of the doubt. I think most bigger companies would get the benefit of the doubt because they've proven themselves in this industry. Obviously, Microsoft has no track record in this in this industry, and you know their their you know showing last year was was pretty embarrassing. And you know it, everybody remembers that, and will always remember their empty booth. Um, it, it, like I said, I, I think if this product had been available last year and been showing last year and this had happened last year, I, I don't think it would be as big of a deal. I, obviously, there's there's always going to be, um, you know, critics and and especially of a big company like like Microsoft. I, you know, obviously they're they're going to have the the target, like I keep saying. But I I do think people will forget about it. It it if the product is good and even if it's bad. I mean, I, I think people will, will forget about, you know, a three-month delay in the long run. It's not a big deal. To me, the, the right. most important line in this article is the sentence, the delayed Surface Hub release is unlikely to be financially significant for Microsoft. Now, when we say Microsoft's a big company, <laughs> let's think about what that really means. In this industry, Crestron is a big company. Right. Microsoft Windows by itself brings in like 25 times as much revenue as all of Crestron. That's one Microsoft product. So let's also not forget what this is for Microsoft. A really cool idea uh, may turn into a really great product, but at the end of the day, it's them just sort of exploring a new market, uh, you know, for fun. In, in light of what you just said, I mean, if you look at their other recent news things, there's a lot of changes going on within the company. Mm -hmm. They're dropping essentially their, their Nokia stuff, let, let go left and right. Right. You know, we see those articles going back and forth and then now this news comes out you know our initial reaction is going on to Microsoft here's another here's another you know is this going to get affected because if Microsoft is cutting 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 and dropping and moving and sliding parts and pieces over uh, to the side it is the surface of already being looked at and going hey maybe it's not going to be the best thing for us let's move to the side and that's gonna you know that's gonna put a little bit of fear in the AV in the AV industry's heart, uh, for the people that are waiting for that, I think. Well, if, I think. Don't if be that afraid. Was, we'll still be there for you. Yeah. Personally, I think if that was going to happen, they probably would have heard that already from ABI, SPL, Whitlock, and some of their other partners that they already had. I mean, I'm sure, the, those guys tested tested the uh, the product before partnering up with with Microsoft in the first place. Mm. Mm. Interesting. All right. Let's let's kind of continue on and, and, and talk about another big company that's you know bigger than all of us. Uh, from commercial integrator Samsung starts to work on 11K resolution. <clears throat> 11K. Justin, can DM handle 11K yet? Uh, well, I actually was here to announce our new 11K certified program. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! Is that why? Is that why? They, uh, yeah. Oh goodness gracious! <laughs> gotcha. Oh man. All right. Uh, no, we don't support 11K today, but uh, sometime soon we're gonna have some new input and output cards. You can just swap right in. All right. And he's not getting actually. So <laughs> he's probably not getting at all. Um, I mean, we, I mean, what this article is about, and what this R and D effort is about, is. This is what I've been saying about 4K for, for three years now. It's just inevitable. How you build displays is pr by printing transistors on a piece of glass. And Moore's Law is very clear. It says every year and a half, you can print twice as many transistors in the same space. Yep. So mobile phones aren't getting any bigger. That means pixel densities are going to go up. Um, so just as, a, as an element of fundamental research, of course pixel densities are going to get higher. Sure, 11K by 2018 on a mobile device, I'll believe it. Um, you know, if you think about it, there's, uh, I, I'm not the optics expert here. We've talked about my bad grades in optical physics before. Um, <clears throat> but when you look at a sheet of paper, or when you look at something in the real world, you can see that it's something in the real world. It's not a picture on a screen. Uh, and that has something to do with, with, with brightness and, and contrast and color depth, but it also has to do with resolution. Um, and at some point, I, I think it'll be, 
ridiculous to extend it any further, but I think we're going to keep pushing and pushing these pixel densities up, and we'll find applications for it. You know, and one day we'll have cool 3D floating hologram displays and things, but these are all just sort of necessary steps in advancing display technology. We, we, we have a story about that, too. So. Uh, oh, the, sorry. Yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> Haven't you ever heard of a segue? I, it, was, it was nice, but I wouldn't give it with these guys. The, the Too early. Guys. Right. Man, no, that's my fault. Mr. Neto, uh, 11K, where are we? Do we need to talk about this, dude? Yes, we do! <laughs> Greg wrote about uh, it. I mean, I got the big freaking phone. Do I need 11K in this? Hold on. I know what Chris is going to say. It's not 11K. It's only 10,870 by 5,000. <laughs> <laughs> that's not true 11K. I wasn't taking cool classes like optical physics like you were. <laughs> <laughs> he was failing them. Look, I wasn't attending them, if that's what you think. Sociology class, that, or anthropology and tourism class, would kick your physical, whatever the hell class that was there. So I will take it. <laughs> I should warn you, we have laser beams. <laughs> well, we move around and study travel. That was my uh, <laughs> my Western. Anyway, no, I didn't have any of those uh, cool classes in college. That's what happens when you go to a lame state school. Um, but uh, I don't need 11K on my cell phone. Do, do I get the whole Moore's Law thing? Absolutely. And, and, and Tim, the, the answer to all that is because they can. Mm -hmm. Because somebody wants to do it. I mean, honestly, do we really need that, that super high end? Yes. Justin's absolutely right. A picture is a picture, and seeing something in sight is two different things. But at some point, there's going to be a cap. I mean, I've already been told, you know, uh, 4K is the 480p or the 720 of what the 1080p, 8K or 16K will be. You know, it's the where we're starting is with 4K, believe it or not. Um, do we really do we really need to have it on a cell phone? Probably not. I yeah. just want to know, is 11K going to be known as Super Duper Ultra HD also? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> we can get more acronyms to it. Yep. Uh, yeah. uh, Greg, from your standpoint, where, I mean, you, this, you guys wrote the story, we, you know, Chelsea wrote the story, but, you know, yeah. um, where do you think this goes? Um, I, I, I think, like Justin was saying, it's going to keep on going because, because it can and because somebody out there wants it. I, I think you know. Eventually, there'll be a, a saturation point or a point where you know it's no longer useful to keep keep extending this. But I, I, obviously, we're we're not at that point yet, and people will buy it when it comes out. You know that. Yeah, absolutely. But as from from uh, from you know your standpoint, whether it's you know mobile or, or what have you, how do we get this from from how do we translate this from a Samsung device to you know putting it on a display somewhere? Um, I really don't know. The 11K is something very crazy, to my opinion. Um, we have not even gone here to 4K. We are barely here on... People don't know what is Ultra HD. Um, I don't know. Um, we need to see how the industry is going. Internet bandwidth. How, how will 11K work? I have no clue. All right, sir. Uh, let's get on from there to... Uh, one of my favorite magazines that's not AV related. It's from EC Mag, uh, Electrical Contractor Magazine, and they talk about the power over Ethernet, uh, power over Ethernet driven applications. And the one thing that this article gets into uh, is the platform. And Justin, I want to start with you because you guys have a number of PoE devices. When it comes to, to working with PoE, what is maybe one or two of the not dangers, but one of the one or one or two. Um, things that the integrators need to make sure that they, they keep keep mindful of? Um, I would say the number one sort of integration and design issue is understanding uh, the different power levels that PoE devices can consume and the different power levels that PoE sources can provide. Uh, so, so the basics of, of when a PoE device plugs in and wakes up is it announces to the power source uh, you know, hey, I'm so-and-so, I support PoE, and I require 7 watts, or I require 13.5 watts, or I require 25 watts. Uh, and then the, the PoE source will set aside that much power from his 100, 500, 1,000 watt, whatever he has supply, dedicate it to that device, and then eventually uh, you might consume all of the power available from that source, and if you plug in a new device, 
uh, it would not be allowed to turn on. It doesn't start browning out everybody. He says, hey, new guy, you can't plug in. Um, so as we get to higher and higher powered node devices, uh, you know, the devices taking power, um, it becomes important to realize that just because, let's say, you have a PoE switch with 48 ports, that doesn't mean that it can drive 25 watts on all 48 ports at the same time. That's like, what is that, 2,000 watts, something like that? Maybe it has that kind of supply. If it does, you'll know from the fans. Um, but if it doesn't, then you need to just be aware at design time and say, oh, this guy can supply you know, 350 watts, so I need to look at the power consumption capabilities, publish specs of the receiving devices, and then just make sure I don't violate the overall power delivery of my source. You know, of course, you might have a dozen ports used by non-PoE devices. Uh, so very often you'll see uh, that, that a, a power source has more ports than it could deliver power to simultaneously. So just be aware of that issue uh, and think of it like you would any power delivery system. Mr. Boaz, from you guys, from, uh, from your integration place, where do you guys um, take PoE? Or have you gotten any, or have you used many PoE devices yet? Yes, but it is very tiny. Um, um, it is definitely integrated. It's becoming a standard. It's coming everywhere, both in IT and in AVs. So in, I see it growing more and more. Uh, Christopher, Mr. Nino, uh, what do you guys use in PoE mostly? PoE? Our Crestron stuff. Man, I love throwing a little plug in there for just that. <laughs> <laughs> now, P the, the stuff that we're doing the PoE is, and where we're playing a lot more with PoE is when we're doing the integrated rooms, the touch panels are going to be powered over. And I mean, these things are not drawing a lot. I don't do a lot of lighting, you know, type stuff that, you know, as the article said, where it's doing, you know, uh, powering some you know, small light, lighting uh, LED things. And, you know, a couple years ago, um, I was pretty impressed for the first time I ever saw that uh, that sort of uh, application working with, you know, TVs being turned on just by PoE. I thought that was, man, that's one day that's going to happen, and it, it, I think it will as you know more efficient and energy efficient TVs happen and stuff like that. It'll definitely work, but PoE stuff right now for the for what it does, it suits our needs for small you know things. But like Justin said, you got to be you got to be aware. You got to be cognizant of you know what you're distributing that power to. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. McCormick, from uh, from talking to integrators, what are some of the drawbacks of, of using PoE? Um, it, I think it's maybe a lack of awareness, like like Justin and, and Chris have been been talking about. Just you just have to make sure you're aware of you know what what the ramifications are when when you do use it, and and you know kind of the when you connect to one thing, it doesn't. Doesn't always doesn't always work out the the way that you uh, you expect it to. So, all right, from our buddies at Innovate, um, Innovate on the net dot net. This is the talk, uh, the article we talked about, the Hololens uh, muscles in in on medical education. Say that by, by times fast. See if I can bring it up here on the on the big screen. What this is, <clears throat> it's oh, it's Microsoft again. Uh, it, it's a it's a Hololens I've never headset. Heard of well, yeah. Um, it, it's a lens headset that lets you. It, it's 3D, right? It's it's almost it's almost to the to the verb of, of the holodeck at, in in Star Trek, but it it's giving you the opportunity to see different levels of the human body is the is the uh, application that they are uh, putting forth here. Uh, Mr. Neto, from your standpoint, and I know you're corporate, and uh, this is this is a lot of education uh, application here. But in the corporate world, or in just you know, put a put an education tech manager hat on for a second. Uh, how much of a use case is this, or how, how how good of a use case is this? I will put on a a, a different cap for you. I okay. one of the things I do a lot of work uh, with, and currently I work with this company almost on a uh, on a daily basis. Is I work on the pharmaceutical side of the business. So um, yeah, it's not really medical, but uh, they've been using holograms for years. To break down molecules and to show molecules and how um, stuff has you know, basically these scientists are creating chemicals and, and stuff like that and they're 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 making 3D holograms of it, um, not necessarily to the HoloLens 
uh, walking around in a VR type thing. But yeah, I've seen the applications, and they use them here. Uh, what HoloLens is doing, really interesting stuff, and I think it's the best case use that we can find for VR and that type of stuff is definitely in the, in the, in the medical world. Um, they're onto something, but again, it's Microsoft, and we started off this podcast with uh, one day it'll happen, and one day this will happen too. All right, Mr. Kennington, you're, you're the one who, who kind of uh, tried to segue into this. Um, how, uh, you know, I, I guess push forward or, or forward thinking is this, uh, and maybe how uh, how practical is this application? Watch this reverse segue. This is the sort of technology where something like 11K pixel density makes sense. <laughs> nice. Very uh, well done. Because look look at what's going on with this thing. It's essentially got some little 3D screens an inch from your eyeball. Uh, so that's where if I did if I did that uh, at a lower resolution, you know, now you see this sort of pixelated image on front of you. But when they when it's that close to your eyeball, you need to have tons and tons of pixels in a very, very small space. Uh, so that what you see looks like a realistic image. Uh, so that's the sort of thing where Samsung's fundamental research of how can we fit this many pixels uh, in a small space sort of finds an application. Um, and what I want is to shrink this down into contact lenses so that I can live my life like Terminator. Remember that, where everything he sees is like red and then there's, there's a little computer printout of like threat analysis, kill this guy. Like I just... I just want to live with that. It could be just random crap, too. I don't need it to actually analyze anything, but just to have those printouts running constantly would just make me very happy, and I want that at a very high resolution. Tim, we got to get Justin a. He should be stroking while he's on this video and, <laughs> and have him get a handlebar mustache to be twirling it at the same time. I just want to know if Tim is concerned that he might be uh, taking over his show with all those segues <laughs> and his Twitter handle. Oh, he's, he's going there. He, you know what? Somebody does. There's always somebody better. The end, he's going to reveal that he is Tim Albright. Yeah, he is Tim Albright. What are you talking about? This is what I look like in 11K. Yes. I'm <laughs> <laughs> not sure if that's a it's compliment a to you or me. All right. Uh, it's correct. not good for either of us, I'm it's sure. Not, Somehow. It, it's, it's not. Um... Craig, where do you uh, where do you come down on this whole 3D um, little visor thing? Um, I, well, between this and drones making advances into the medical field, it's it's obviously that's that's where the technology is going, or, or quite a quite a substantial amount of it. It's it's pretty uh, pretty interesting to see the advances uh, that that could be made, and and certainly this technology is not there yet and and like Chris said someday you know someday it'll it'll be there maybe um, it's it, it, it's neat to think about I, I don't know where it is just yet um, how far along it is and you know how, how long it'll be before it's adopted widespread and all, all that stuff but it, it, it's it's pretty pretty interesting I, I'm not sure how I'd feel if my doctor walked in and you know was was wearing one of these but that's uh, that's that's another what if, story. But what if it was the 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 you know, seriousness? What if it was the contact lenses that Justin was talking about? Yeah, I, the I ones mean, that say kill this guy. Yeah, <laughs> no, I don't want my doctor yeah, wearing that. Yeah, definitely uh, wouldn't want that. Give him... Never mind. All right, let's move on. Uh, from the I mind. actually think, in context to to Terminator, I think not only medical, it will also go into the security yeah. courses at some point. Yeah, absolutely. Super soldiers, man. That's what we're going. That's what it's all going to super soldiers. All right, let's it let's get we're to the solution. Stop with the conspiracy <laughs> theories. Uh, from the mind of Jillian Phillips, Carolyn Hines wrote, writes this piece: the importance of selling managed services. Uh, Jillian Phillips, if you don't know, he's uh, an executive with Whitlock. Um, he's been he's been evangelizing for quite a long time, uh, as well as others, um, about the importance of selling services. Uh, Justin, we'll probably you know, let you off the hook on this one unless you want to chime in. Uh, Oaz, we're going to start start with you though. Um, when it comes to uh, you know AB in Uganda, and I, and I really hate to, to keep harping on that, but it, it is something interesting to me that uh, here's someone who's who's doing AB outside of the U.S. Do you guys sell more uh, boxes, or do you sell more insula insulation? Um, you know that part of it, or do you really have you guys gotten um, in the mindset of selling services? Um, 
right now we sell a bit of everything. I don't know if you can hear me. I think internet went yeah. off. Um, no, I think I'm back. Um, we sell a bit of everything, um, and it always looked like it's not there, it's not here. Um, but I believe it's a good thing. We're doing a lot of education, and we are exposing people. So in the next two to three years, I believe Africa will be the the fastest growing in AV. So right now we sell a bit of almost every solution, and the demand is high. Uh, but it will just take time to 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 even have any kind of statistics to be able to analyze uh, what is going to move or what is not. All right, Chris. From your standpoint, and you're you're more in the in the corporate world. Is that is that where where folks who are servicing the corporate world need to be headed? Well, I mean, every other every other industry is in that, you know, trying to, to push that managed service role. I mean, but we've we've talked about this at, at at shows and events, and even at the CI summit, we, this was brought up um, as far as uh, last year when we talked about it. Um, my my sticking point with managed service is this. Everybody wants to sell it. It sounds great in theory, uh, but there is a responsibility to the integrator, to the consultant, um, and even to manufacturers that are trying to sell the managed service as well. That you know, if you, the, the managed service is only going to be successful with the people that you have working. So if you want to sell a service, you better have the qualified people, you better have the dedicated people, and you better have the knowledgeable people there working on the team to make this successful. Because if what you're trying to sell is printouts and spreadsheets that are going to go back to a customer, then you know, they're going to get they're they're going to feel like that's that they're, you're not you're not getting that value. So, yeah, you want to sell a managed service, you want to you want to you know, outsource uh, you know, something that people would normally do in-house and bring it back as a service and, and able to, to, to sell that or charge for that, uh, you better put the value in there. And packing the value in is you're going to have to educate your staff, you're going to have to put some time and money and invest in the staff that you have, and you're going to have to elevate your game from just going out and finding a guy who knows what a BNC cable used to be or an RJ45 and invest some time and effort and money into these people because they're the ones that are going to make that make or break that managed service or, or solution for your company. All right, Mr. McCormick, as with the uh, number of integrators you talk to on a daily and weekly basis, what are uh, what are you getting the feeling for? Is, is, are they headed that way, or are they still in the, uh, I'm going to sell you know an integrated service here, or an integrated solution here? Well, I don't think it's a coincidence that the most successful integrators are the ones that, that have been selling managed services for, for years, you know. The, the last couple of years at, at the very least and, and have kind of perfected the model at this point. It's, it's starting to trickle down a little bit to the, the medium and the smaller size integrators. Um, certainly there are some that, that are a little slower to, to catch on to it. Um, Chris did bring up an interesting point about you know the, the sales staff especially. Um, one of the integrators I talked to uh, mentioned that he has an entirely separate staff for selling you know, selling the services as opposed to selling the boxes. Um, hmm. You can't really, yeah, you can't really, uh, I don't know, transition from, from one to the other. I, I think if you've been selling boxes for a long time, that that's kind of, you're, you're thinking, you know, about, about profit and, you know, immediate sales and, and that sort of thing. With, with managed services, it's more of a long-term investment and you're not out there to, you know, make, make the big bucks right away. So it, it's, it's a, it's a little different mentality and, um, it, a lot of the the people that that sell boxes aren't kind of equipped to to sell the the services as as well. So, it's it's not an easy transition for them to make. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, that's one of those things. And, and in talking to Julian, you know, he he is still you know big on it. You know, yeah, obviously you still have to you have to you know you still have to sell the the, the actual equipment. Sure. Um, but along with that, you know, moving more towards an IT based you know solutions model service model. So. I think there is still also a, a way the manufacturers play a role here, and that is in in delivering equipment that can be easily managed. So we want to try and yeah. lessen that burden on the integrator. Uh, Chris is right. You're going to have to train people in a different way. They're going to have to operate in a different way. Uh, but if we can deliver equipment that is built from the ground up to be manageable and to anticipate problems and to report what's going on, 
then, then the, the load on the business, the integrator's business, to deliver these services is much less and they can be much more efficient in giving their clients, the end users eventually, what they want, which is just tell me that everything's working and fix it before somebody has a problem. Okay, so but as a manufacturer then, Justin, how do you guys do that? I mean, is it something where you, you talk with uh, more IT folks than, than your integrator folks, or you start with them, or do you even start with their end users? Absolutely. We, we talk to everybody. Part of Crestron's strategy uh, is, to, is to be a, a more IT-centric, more service and management-focused uh, organization. So, yes, at the end of the day, what we build and sell and ship on UPS trucks are little black boxes, but those black boxes, for example, are all Ethernet connected. Uh, they all plug into our Fusion platform, or they plug into your existing SNMP platform, so that there is, a higher, at a higher level, uh, a software platform in your organization uh, that can reach out, communicate with all these little black boxes that we sold you, uh, and help you understand the overall health of that system. So it really starts for us at the beginning of product design, you know, okay, it's easy to build a little HDMI extender, but what intelligence do we need to build into that HDMI extender so that in the final stages of this whole product uh, it can be managed without you know a team of a hundred guys just running from room to room uh, seeing what's going on okay so here's another question for you when in the process your your, your asset management software is called fusion there's other ones have other yeah, ones of course um, in what where in the process do you start that I mean because obviously you know you Product managers will, will say, okay, we want to do this, right? Whether it's in a mm -hmm. new a DM switcher or what have you. Yeah. Where in the process is that asset management component sl slotted in? Is it, you know? Well, f well, for us, you know, since we have a, an existing platform now in Fusion, uh, and I mentioned we also plug into SNMP uh, with no problem. I like to plug our third party support. Um, uh, but but that comes in at the very beginning. We all understand what a fusion is and what manageability is. So when I, for example, write a product requirement, I say I need a new switch. It needs to have six HDMI ports and three HD base T ports, and I want to be able to fusion needs to be able to grab such and such data. What source is routed? Is the display turned on? Uh, is the device overheating? What is its fan speed? Whatever those parameters are. And then when it goes to engineering, they know, okay, well, I'm going to need a CPU that can connect to the Ethernet bus. I'm going to need fan speed controllers that can report uh, on, their, on their status. I'm going to need uh, to be able to communicate with the HDMI gear itself to understand, you know, what's going on there. Uh, and then that CPU and the firmware that runs it becomes the sort of clearinghouse in that small little box in that distributed system to be able to report those things up the chain to the higher level software that's, that's running the enterprise. Oh, very interesting. All right. Uh, as we wrap up here, something we like we try like we try to like. Let me just somebody else talk for me, please, because it's been a while. About the real Tim Albright. Yes, the real Tim. You know, something we, we try to do uh, on a weekly basis is uh, give our, our fine folks at our buddies and our pals at, at uh, periodicals and magazines and such uh, the chance to tell uh, kind of what their their community and their their areas are talking about. Today's, uh, this week's periodical uh, is Commercial Integrator, and our buddy Craig McCormick, um, my favorite Boston Red Sox fan, is going to give us a couple uh, a couple stories. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for those of you who can see behind me, you, you can see uh, a lot of the covers of uh, Commercial Integrator magazine over the years. Um, I, I happen to have this month's issue available, and you, you might notice that there's uh, four four folks on, on the cover this time. Uh, usually, our our company profiles uh, focus on um, that we we end up talking to the CEO of the of the companies, and uh, in in this case, we talked to some some owners of the company. Um, the the company is AVI Systems, and and they employ what's called an employee stock ownership program, which means all uh, employees in the companies are all double as owners of the company. So everybody kind of has a, a stake in in what goes on with the with the the business, um, it, it's a fairly common practice in the corporate world. It's, it's fairly unique in, on the AV side, and, and the uh, profile talks about some of the challenges related to that, and kind of the opportunities for for other uh, other companies to kind of follow that model. Um, it's it's an in interesting company, and uh, it's an interesting uh, approach to to uh, to ownership. Well, and um, the other thing about them is they just got their apex right at right they at. Did. Uh, so, yeah, I absolutely love this story. I love these guys. Uh, our uh, our good friend, Ms. Kelly, uh, Kelly, uh, Kelly Perkins, uh, works for them, and, and yeah, big, big fan of those guys. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, the other other big uh, big topic on our website these days is our integration awards, which is um, a look at uh, 13 different uh, markets and the top projects in in those markets. Um, the the projects themselves were were uh, not self nominations. The the company sent in uh, applications, filled fill out uh, pretty lengthy applications, and sent us several uh, photos, uh, as you can see at the bottom of that, along with uh, you know takeaways for the integrators, takeaways for the end users, and we uh, we we just picked the, uh, the the winners in those thirteen uh, thirteen categories and, and posted the they're included in our July issue and. and uh, all posted on our, our website as we speak. Um, and the, the last thing I want to mention is that we are wrapping up the nominations for our CI 40 under 40. It's the uh, second year we've done the uh, this list. Last year uh, a couple of the panelists were, were on the list including Mr. Neto and our host uh, Mr. Albright. He, uh, he has the distinction of being the first one to appear in the list by virtue of his last name, starting with an A, and because he was the best person in the industry, right? Damn Skippy. Right. So he, he it, he's he's challenged us on on our our headline about the uh, the application, saying it's it's uh, bit back and better than ever. So we're it's impossible uh, to be better than ever. He's, Just that's 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 what I've heard you've said, and. Uh, we're we're uh, we're pretty confident that it it'll at least be as good. We we have uh, you know quite a few nominations. Uh, we we did ask the the 40 on the list last year, the 40 or so on the list last year to uh, send in some nominations of, of people we we might not know about and you know people they respect and are, and are interested in. And we've gotten decent response on that. Um, but we, again, we're hearing about a lot of uh, cool people that that we. You know, didn't know about, and some some certainly that we did that that were not included on the list last year will uh, will be included this year, and uh, it, it's it's a it's a really neat initiative, and it's something that people responded well to last year, and we decided to uh, to do it again. Yeah, and I, you know, in all seriousness, it, it you know I, I was I was very very honored and, and humbled by it, and uh, you guys will do a great job. So. And and your your hand is uh, sore from all those autographs you've had yes. in, uh, in the past year, I'm sure. Um, we we are uh, wrapping up the nominations on that today. Uh, I, I'm sure there will be some stragglers next week, but what we are trying to trying to wrap it up today. So so if uh, people have any ideas of who should be nominated, you can send uh, send me an email, and I'll I'll uh, send you the very short application. Yeah, yeah it's, it's just a few, you know, basically, who is this person, and, well, how old are they, and then, you know, are they cool enough to be on this list? And, Justin, you can't because you work for a manufacturer. That's one of the one of the caveats. Otherwise, every spot would be filled with Justin Kennington. This is an outrage. I know. It's ridiculous. <laughs> it is ridiculous. All right, guys, that's going to do it. Yeah, do it. We'll start with Justin. Justin, thank you so much for, for, for coming on, sir. Of course. And how can people get a hold of you and or Crestron? www.crestron.com cool. slash 4K. Slash, I was waiting for it. <laughs> slash 4K. Uh, Boaz, thank you, buddy. Thank you for all the way from Uganda for staying up late on a Friday night for us. No problem. It's my pleasure. Um, I just want to make a call for everyone, manufacturers, integrators. This is a huge market here, and there is right now no competition. Um, there's a lot of space for everyone to come in. Um, it is a serious upgrowing in terms of numbers. It's around a thousand percent growth every month. Uh, sorry, every year. Um, um, not every month. Um, we have done statistics for Crema, and it's 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 huge. There is potential. People don't know how to come and how to work in Africa, but please come study how to come in, I can help as much as I can. Um, my website, www.proav.ug, um, or my, my Twitter, Facebook, just Google me, I'm everywhere. Boaz Shani, and, and just like it sounds, Boaz, S-H-A-N-I on uh, on Twitter. Thank you, sir, so much. Uh, and we'll see thank you, you as at well. NIC, most likely. Um, Mr. McCormick, thank you, sir. Thank you bet. How can people get a hold of you and or commercial integrator? Uh, Microsoft.com. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, Commercialintegrator.com. If you if you can fi if, if Tom fires you, you you gotta just make a call to Redmond, aren't you? 
Uh, it's commercialintegrator.com or uh, Twitter is Craig McCormick. Craig McCormick. All right. And last but not least, Mr. Christopher Nano. Thank you, sir. Thank you, but I am pissed. I need to clarify some stuff here. First uh -oh. of all, I am upset that Craig McCormick did not talk about his Star Wars story. <laughs> because I'm hearing about that. Yes, That's Star Wars upsetting. Story? Yes. Uh, yeah. We yeah, just just recently posted, actually posted it yesterday about an exhibit that that I heard about from uh, from Adrian Boyd. It's it's in Seattle right now at the EMP Museum. It's going to be uh, traveling the country for the next five years, and it's, it's the Smithsonian one, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah and yeah. it's yeah, it's it's a it's a interactive exhibit that uh, looks at the costumes in the Star Wars uh, saga. So, I, I've heard that uh, that Chris is going to be hanging out for uh, about six weeks when it when it moves to New York in November. Just uh, the six weeks before the uh, the next movie opens, he's going to be hanging out in the uh, in the museum there. It's a good time to to be there. Yeah. Right, what else are you pissed at, Chris? Uh, what else am I pissed at? I am pissed at that you did not talk about the email that we received from the Home Office in at Lona. No, not at Lona, Altona, um, uh, Illinois that we now have a new underwriter in Crestron. Thank you, Justin. Yes, sir. Yes. <laughs> You're pissed. <laughs> I'm pissed. I'm pissed because Tim should have been talking about this as soon as we came out the gate. I'm no, pissed we we're underwriting this damn show. Well. <laughs> I'm kidding. I love you guys. Yes. We will now, we will now get you the evil cat and that whole Dr. <laughs> evil. It'll be awesome. Come Perfect. on every week and tell us about things in 4K land. <laughs> uh, outside of that, uh, do, do I need to be upset about anything else? No. No, that's pretty much it. You can find me on the internet, uh, I'm just about everywhere, at uh, Chris underscore Neto on Twitter. I'm there. I'm uh, extremely excited about how well the uh, our AV selfie video has done. Uh, we pretty much did the um, you know 30 days of trying to push that and promote it, and we've hit roughly uh, 2,500 views, which is up 1,000 from last year, which is awesome. So that's part of my uh, homework that I do for AV Nation, and uh, you know that whole coming together that was awesome. I haven't been on since uh, since uh, Infocom, so Infocom, yeah. to thank people for going to the tweet up, making that successful. I've been upset with you because I'm trying to DM you and message you while you're on the show, saying you've got to remember to thank people, <laughs> thank the underwriter. Well, that you do, but you know I got I got some responsibilities to AV Nation. Um, yeah, he's got a lot. <laughs> Outside of that, man, you can find me on the internet, uh, Chris underscore Neto on Twitter. You can find my company, which is uh, AV Help Desk, which is www.avhelpdesk.com. Uh, again, we're a design consultant based out of Boston, but uh, I don't go up there to watch Red Skin games unless I'm there to hang out with Craig. We're stopped by the corporate world headquarters of commercial, uh, commercial integration. Absolutely. Uh, that's, uh, that's what I've been up to, man. I will see you at the CI Summit. At a couple weeks. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, we've got we've got a busy time. Chris, one thing Chris does, and, and he started this a couple of months ago. Um, actually, when when we started doing ISC and, and that, what did you call it? The the AV Nation World Tour. That's and, it. And um, we uh, so we've got uh, CI Summit coming up. We've got um, uh, Cedia coming up. We've got a couple other things that, that we're not at liberty to say yet, but those are coming up as well. So that'll be kind of cool. And yes, we have. Um, a brand new underwriter uh, in in Crestron. Certain things haven't happened yet, but that's that's cool. It did you yeah, um, to kind of let the cat out of the bag before that happens? So thank you, Justin, and, and thank you, uh, everybody at Crestron, for coming on board. Sounds like we haven't mailed the check. If, if I heard you right just now, I didn't say that. Is, is that the issue? I just said that there are certain eyes have been have not been <laughs> dotted and t's have not been crossed, and so you know. uh, they're waiting for four thousand dollars. Four K. I'm, I'm waiting for four K. Yes. No. Yeah, you should have held out for eleven. I should have held out for eleven. You're right. Yeah. Um, anyhow, so thank you very much. Uh, if you're interested in, in what the this whole underwriting thing is about, um, there's a there's a page on our website, uh, avnation.tv, avnation.tv. Uh, it just kind of spells it out. We don't sell ads. We we do underwriting. It's it's for sort of a PBS, BBC type model. But uh, if you're interested, then you can check it out there. Um, and go by the website if you would. Uh, don't follow me, but go by the website, avnation.tv. You'll find this program and a host of others. Uh, we have brand new state of controls, brand new ed techs coming down the pipeline, brand new live lives, 
all sorts of, of really cool, great shows. Uh, and a couple of really cool things coming down uh, as far as as bloggers. Um, we're uh, our, our team is working on some really great things for AV Month. Uh, do that again, and uh, and some other interesting things. So yeah, check out the website avnation.tv, avnation.tv. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks so much for watching. This has been AV Week. <laughs>